Welcome to the National Library. I'm Rebecca Bateman and I'm the, the Indigenous Curator here at the Library. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on whose land we are meeting and listening and learning and sharing today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present and future. Thank you for coming to this afternoon's presentation by the Library's 2019 Creative Arts Fellow. Through the, throughout the last 10, 10 months, we've enjoyed having a total of 18 fellows and scholars in residence, not all at the same time, of course. Um, their interest areas have been incredibly diverse, which has made for a fabulous program of presentations. For this, we extend our gratitude to the donors who generally allow us to open our collections to the curiosity of researchers and scholars. The annual Creative Arts Fellowship is supported by the Friends of the National Library of Australia. The Library is very grateful to the Friends for their ongoing sponsorship of this much sought after fellowship, which allows artists the opportunity to immerse themselves in research and, develop new, and to develop new work that creatively uses the Library's collections. This is the fifth year of the Friends Creative Arts Fellowship. And the Fellowships Committee have recently selected the 2020 Creative Arts Fellow with a successful applicant to be announced later this month. So watch this space. Uh, today, we welcome Joel Bray, um, our 2019 Creative Arts Fellow. Joel is a choreographer, a performer with Chunky Move, a next-gen creator with Black Dance and a proud Wiradjuri man. Joel's performances have been seen nationally and internationally. During his fellowship, Joel has been researching a wide range of materials which document traditional Indigenous ceremonial practices in the southeast of the continent, in particular the R.H. Matthews material and Charles H. Carey collections. This research will form the basis for a new work of immersive dance theatre for large-scale presentation in 2021 entitled Burbung. Burbung is the Wiradjuri word for ceremony. In a ceremony, rituals repeat unchanged, but the participant arrives each time with a greater wisdom and hierarchical standing and can peel back the significance of the ceremony's embedded knowledge. Today, Joel will share with us his research into the traditional Indigenous ceremonial practices and how this has inspired him in the creation of his new work of dance theatre. Please join me in welcoming Joel. Thanks, Rebecca. Hello. Um, I'd like to join Rebecca in um, acknowledging the traditional owners of this place. I want to thank them for allowing me to be here to speak um, and also for being here with me over the last few months as I've done my research here in the library. Um, so my name is Joel Bray. Uh, I'm a Wiradjuri man, and that's uh, not far from here, central New South Wales. Um, and uh, that's through my father, Christopher Kirkbright. So I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge my elders and ancestors. Um, when I was born, uh, I came out looking like this. <laughs> <laughs> so my father gave me the name Dalara Yuran, which means hair of snow. Um, and I have spent the last 37 years explaining to everyone um, that I'm Aboriginal. <laughs> um, and in fact, for many years, I, I, I didn't really publicly identify as, I mean, I knew I was Aboriginal, but I didn't publicly identify. It was just um, kind of too complicated to explain, I guess. Um, and then one day, not that long ago, an auntie said to me, she kind of like tutted and um, shook her head at me. And she said, if you don't publicly identify as black, then your successes don't get counted as our successes. And I hadn't really thought of it like that before. Um, since then, um, I've been on a, on a journey for the last few years, a period of intense exploration of my cultural identity. Um, sorry, it's weird. I can do like an hour and a half performance, fine, but give me a lecture and I'm like <laughs> shaking with nerves, so I apologise. Um, uh, I've been on a, on a journey of my family history, my kin connections and my Wiradjuri roots. This has been both a personal and an artistic journey. Those audiences who have seen my last three choreographic works um, have borne witness to this journey, an odyssey 
that I've only really just begun and which in equal parts thrills and terrifies me, inspires and sometimes paralyzes me. Exactly 10 days ago today, this journey took me up for the first time to my ancestral country. I drove from Dubbo to the Macquarie Marshes up past Canambal. Dad was in the passenger seat. Our conversation petered out as we approached Quambone, the bone dryness of the drought gripping the parched country as we sped through in the blank white hire car. Dad had spoken of this place and of his grandfather, Christopher Horace Riley, the third youngest of the Riley brothers, the patriarchs of the massive Riley clan. The eldest brother, Patrick, had been the oldest and the designated lawman of the clan. And somewhere in the middle was Alec, the now famous Tracker Riley. If anyone has seen the film Blood on the Waddle, it talks about my great, great uncle, Alec. And of course, my great grandfather, Christopher. Population 197, the sign read as we rolled into Quambone. Dad and I were silent with the significance of this moment. This was the first time either of us had been to great grandfather Christopher's birthplace. The fuel light flashed red. Shit, I spat. There was no service station and I couldn't get any phone reception. I discovered the downside of having Optus out in the country. <laughs> I panicked, but Dad just giggled at my panic and jumped out of the car, wandered into the pub, and waltzed out a moment later with the publican in tow. He took us to a fuel pump, and then we wandered into the pub to pay him and decided to order a couple of beers. We're here because this is where my son's great-grandfather was born, Dad said, and we're looking for the sacred borer ground we think is close by. Barely a flick of interest registered on the barman's face. I tried a different tack. Any blackfellas in town? The barman scowled. No real blackfellas, he said. Look, I'm not racist or anything, but I'm not even joking. They live over the mission. He flicked his thumb over his shoulder. They're all drunk and they're on drugs, but they know not to come here and cause problems. One corner of his scowling mouth curled up into a sniggering smile. Dad and I decided to take our beers outside. Time seemed to have stopped still in Quambone. It's a grid of about four streets of red dust, broken chicken wire fencing, and an eerie silence. The mission turned out to be four derelict houses in a row, broken windows, the carcasses of prams, play equipment, and rusted car bodies littered around. The only signs of life were the skeletal dogs barking and chasing us as we drove past. We're related to them, for sure. Dad said quietly to me. We took the turn off towards the Macquarie Marshes. The road got steadily worse. I knew I should have booked a four-wheel drive. I'd seen photos and videos of the Macquarie Marshes. There were supposed to be lush wetlands brimming with reeds, shrubs and crowded trees. There were supposed to be flocks of birds and brolgers and cranes and finches and of every other type imaginable. Instead, we rumbled past country fast becoming desert. Dry, dead trees, the exposed bones of kangaroos, of fencing and farming equipment and, equipment and pumps, and the occasional emu scratching in the dust. Silence descended heavily upon us again. I could feel an ache creep in around my heart. The bleakness, the death of this place, was more than just seasonal drought. We could see before us the results of 200 years of rapacious theft of water in the name of irrigation, of deforestation for grazing, and of other farming techniques simply out of sync with this beautiful country. We had been traveling for two weeks and seen plenty of such sites, empty sandy creek beds, bleached tree skeletons and parched earth. But this time I felt the sting more keenly this was the country where my ancestors were born and lived. This is where my great grandfather and his brothers would have played as children. I imagine them splashing through the streams and marshes and somersaulting into waterholes. I imagine them stalking prey, learning to hunt, climbing trees to steal eggs from nests and spearing fish and diving for food. Taught by their fathers and their mother's brothers, who had been taught by their elders before them, stretching back to time immemorial, now all gone. At one point, 
I pulled aside and we put and we got out of the car. We stood in silent despondence and debated turning around. Thankfully, it was Dad who urged us to push on. When you looked closely, you could see that the country is sick, but she's not dead. Trees cling to their greenery with fierce determination, and small birds flit between them. There were plenty of ravens, wagan in our language, and magpies and parrots in every colour of the rainbow, and the beautiful blue flash of the azure kingfisher flying by. When we paused and lifted our ears, we could hear the bird song and the breeze in the trees. The country, sick as she is, is not yet dead. We drove on. In my mind's eye, I pulled up the hand-drawn maps R.H. Matthews had scrawled of the ceremonial ground we were seeking. I must have pored over those rough sketches hundreds of times over the past year. And then I saw it. The sign for the Bulgaraga Creek. Matthew's words flashed back to me. The general encampment was on the left or west bank of the Bulgaraga Creek, about a quarter mile easterly from portion number 11 of the parish of Wollongbone, County of Gregory. Matthews had been a map maker, so he was really specific. We pulled to the side of the road. I got out and peered over the barbed wire fence. And there it was, at least I think it was. In the crook of the creek, exactly as he had sketched it, a patch of ground unusually free of shrubs. With a strange certainty, I knew this place to be the Bourbon ground I had been looking for. Over my shoulder, I heard Dad whisper, you can see it has been trampled with many dancing feet. Without thinking, I broke into a run. I raced towards the Bora ring, heart racing. Stop, Dad called out from behind me. The urgency in his voice brought me to a halt. We can't just go charging in there, he said to me. I remembered Matthews had, made, had marked a smoking place on the map, on the eastern shore of the now dry creek bed. I led us to where I thought it might have been, roughly. Dad knelt down and started a fire, burning the drooping waddle he had brought with him. We let the smoke flow over us and into us. As we finished the smoking ceremony, I looked across the creek bed and wondered to myself, how can I know if this is a place? And if it is, how can we know if it's okay to go in? The thought had barely drifted across my consciousness when an enormous wedge-tailed eagle swooped down and landed on a branch not 20 meters from us, right on the edge of the Bourbon ground. Malian, I cried out, eagle and dad looked up there the eagle perched majestic and magnificent and beneath him two dark wallabies all three sat dead still gazing at us for an endless moment and then in unison bounded off it was in that moment that i knew we had found it look i can't be certain yet that i found the exact spot the next step is we're going to consult with some of the local mob who live in the area and with the National Parks and Wildlife Service to see if someone has registered this place as a sacred site. Dad and I are already starting to talk about getting a LIDAR camera to survey the site, which is a, I don't understand how it works, it's like a kind of a scanning camera that you can put on a drone and check the archaeology of a site. So this is definitely still a work in progress, but I felt something there, something real. The Burbang is the men's initiation ceremony for us Wiradjuri people. It's also the word for the ceremonial ground itself. For some reason, the Gamilaroi word Bora has come into common usage, so you'll often hear people speak of Bora grounds or Bora rings, but I'm going to use the Wiradjuri word, Burbang. I first came upon this word two years ago. I live with type two bipolar disorder and I was stuck at home during a particularly nasty bout of depression and anxiety. I had a overdosed on Netflix and shredded my lungs with too many cigarettes and drowned my sorrows in red wine. And then on a whim, I decided to Google the term Wiradjuri ceremony. 
In retrospect, I can see the connection between my struggles with mental illness and my desire to connect with ceremony. I read a book this year called Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression by Johan Hari. In it, the author debunks the pharmaceutical company's mythologies that depression and anxiety are a result of a chemical imbalance in the brain that can simply be fixed with drugs. Instead, Hari argues, mental illness is a very logical stress response to a contemporary world in which we have lost authentic connections with each other and with our own bodies, with nature, with meaningful work and so on. I am a choreographer. So I'm interested in the body and how we as bodies engage with other bodies, which is one way to say that I'm interested in ritual, or as we say in contemporary Aboriginal English, I'm interested in ceremony. Ceremony strikes me as a form of collective medicine, a time and a place in which we can come together as a community to build restore and strengthen the connections between us as kin with other people in our community, with the country and the other sentient beings we share this country with, the birds and the animals around us, and with the cosmos more generally. So I was, I believe, subconsciously seeking out something I knew I was missing. And I think ceremony is something we are missing in our contemporary lives. Pre-capitalist society was rich with shared ritual life. The ancient Celtic and early Christian European calendars were full of holidays and feasts and celebrations which brought people together. Rituals that served to reinforce collective solidarity, to continue oral traditions and to transfer ancient knowledge of everything from food and medicine to geography and social governance. And the same can be said for literally every corner of the globe. I think we've lost that. Rituals under late stage capitalism seem to have been stripped down to something desultory, brief and semantic. And the result is, I think, an epidemic of disconnection and loneliness. In my case, I've been hungering for greater knowledge of and connection with the ceremonial practices of my Wiradjuri ancestors. So I guess this is what triggered me to Google Wiradjuri ceremony that day. And what I found was an obscure old article entitled The Burbang of the Wiradjuri Tribes, published in the Journal of the Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland in 1896 by a man named Robert Hamilton Matthews. And this launched me onto a journey of discovery that brought me here to the National Library of Australia and found me 10 days ago standing on the edge of that Burbang ground looking into the eyes of that eagle. R.H. Matthews was a surveyor with the New South Wales colonial government. So this meant he spent much of his time out on the frontier, frontiers of the colony, where many Aboriginal people were still living semi-traditionally. By this point, towards the end of the 19th century, most Aboriginal people were living on stations or missions, but were sometimes still being given leave to congregate and undertake corroboree and ceremony. R.H. Matthews came to anthropology quite late, but he became one of the most prolific writers on Aboriginal culture in the southeast of the continent and published over 170 articles. He was principally interested in the kinship and marriage systems and in the male initiation ceremonies. He also wrote language lists that have been used in the various projects to reclaim language, including Wiradjuri, and he did a pretty decent job of recording and sketching rock paintings and various sacred objects, including widow's caps and mortuary stones. So I came here to the library to delve into the Matthews collection. I didn't really know what I was getting into, but it has been an absolute treasure trove. There are 14 archival boxes of his papers, articles, drafts, off prints, letters and field notes. And it's been an absolute pleasure and privilege to immerse myself in them. It's strange. I've developed a kind of a weird relationship with this man over that time. On the one hand, he is very clearly a coloniser. His language is often dismissive and discrediting. And he was clearly sure of himself as a member of a higher civilization and didn't doubt the right of white fellows to rule over black fellows. But 
I don't know, I get a sense from him that he had a genuine reverence for our culture. Yes, he seemed resigned to the fact that Aboriginal people in our culture would disappear, but he doesn't seem to want that to happen. In fact, there's a kind of urgency to his writing. He wants to record as much as possible before it's lost. Of course, he was wrong. It wasn't lost. And we're in the middle of a renaissance of Aboriginal culture down here in the southeast of the continent. It seems certain that he engendered trust with the blackfellas he spoke with. I kept on finding myself surprised by what and how much the lawmen chose to share with him. This says to me that he spent the time to develop genuine relationships with mob back then, and that he had proven himself to be trustworthy. They trusted him, and so, as I read, I found myself trusting him. Matthews eventually published two separate articles about the Bordelbung that occurred in 1893 on the Bulgaraga Creek near Quambone, one in 1896 and a second in 1897. In 1900, he published a further short article on another ceremony that happened a little further south from there in 1898. He also published articles detailing a further three ceremonies, one on the upper Lachlan River, a second down on the Murrumbidgee River at a place called Darlington Point, and a third out west on the Knoebel Run near Coba. And excitingly, I discovered in his field notes a pretty full description of a sixth ceremony that he appears to have never published, a ceremony that occurred near Gundagai. What's so useful about having six different examples detailed by the same writer is that it gives us the ability to compare and contrast. He orders each of his descriptions in more or less the same manner, and so it's possible to identify what were the common shared characteristics across all of Wiradjuri country. Conversely, it's possible to identify which elements were local variations, or even where there was scope for personal interpretation by the people present at the ceremony. So what actually happened in the ceremony? It's at this point that I should probably yarn a little bit about the process I have been using to, <clears throat> that I have been using in choosing what to reveal and what not to reveal, about how I am navigating the tricky shoals of permission, sacred and secret, and the difference between men's and women's businesses. First of all, we have to acknowledge that the whole account is completely biased towards men's business. Matthews was a bloke, so he spoke with men, and it would have been considered culturally inappropriate for women to speak with him, let alone share women's business with him. So from his writings, we get a sense that the Borobang was all about men's business, but I don't think that's necessarily true. In fact, men and women congregated together for many of the rituals before they would then separate off. And then Matthews would detail the stories, the dances and rituals that would have, been, that would have constituted secret men's business. I presume that the women were also doing their own business. It's just that from Matthew's accounts, we don't know what that was. Further, I was really um, conscious myself as I did the research not to follow any li many lines of research that would have gone down into women's business, since that's not my um, job. Um, Suffice to say, though, that if the colonial culture hadn't been quite so patriarchal, there would have been many more women out in the field and we might have been able to know a little bit more about women's business as a result. My visit up to the Bulgaraka Creek site was the culmination of a two-week process of travelling around on country, conferring and consulting with elders. Dad and I also visited Darling Point. We had a quick look around, um, but we need to do some more research to find the actual site. This eldership consultation was a rich process that allowed me to share what I had found in the archives with my elders and to confirm the findings veracity. Through this whole process, I've tried to remind myself that this is the voice of one white man and everything I read needs to be checked. The other element is that as far as I can tell, the information shared by the old men with Matthews wasn't coerced. They chose to share the information with him, knowing that he would publish it in some form. As we read through, one gets a sense that they were editing what they were telling him. We can safely assume that they didn't share the very sacred knowledge with him. So, in a way, I'm choosing to trust the old people back then, 
that they knew what they were doing in sharing this information with Matthews. In fact, sometimes I had this strong feeling that they knew exactly what they were doing. Wiradjuri cosmology thinks over the long term. We think in terms of generations and in thousands of years. Sometimes I had this strong impression that these wise people had shared this information with Matthews, knowing that sometime down the track, we would come along and pick up the clues that they laid down for us. I don't know if that's just me getting too spooky. That's what I felt. Um, a final issue I need to engage with is exactly whose country each ceremony happened on. Only two of the six ceremonies happened unambiguously in Wiradjuri territory as we understand it today. For instance, the Bulgaraga Creek Bourbon that I've spoken about involved five clans, three from the Mkohori River, sorry, six clans, that's my mistake, three from, from the three from the Castlereagh River, the mole country of the lower Macquarie River and the clan from the Barwon River all spoke wild one. And in fact, this area of the Macquarie marshes is considered wild one country. The Bogan River clan and the clan that came from Cobar spoke Wongaboyn. And there was one more clan that came from the upper Macquarie, so further south, who spoke um, Wiradjuri. Interestingly, Matthews refers to all of them as being part of the great Wiradjuri community. Likewise, in the southeast, Yuan people from the Shoalhaven participated in Borbang on the Tumut River, and Wiradjuri mob from Yas participated in ceremony around here in, in Quimbian. There could be two reasons the extant ceremonies seem to happen all in the border countries. So uh, one thing I noticed was that there were no ceremonies in that he talks about anyway in, say, like Orange or Bathurst, those areas that are really in the middle of Wiradjuri country. Um, so there might be two reasons for that, uh, and they're something I want to continue exploring. It might have always been like that. So perhaps um, the Borbang, the ceremony, was strategically held on, this, on the borders of country so that, they, um, so that they became a meeting point for different mobs where they could meet, talk, share, trade, and intermarry. An alternative explanation might be that by this point in the history of colonization, the central fertile and gold rush areas of Wiradjuri country had already been so heavily colonized that they no longer had access to the Bourbang sites. As I read Matthews, he seems to define the social groupings a little differently from the language groupings we're familiar with today. I wonder if this says something about the power linguists have had in shaping our knowledge of pre-colonial Australia. As a dancer and a choreographer, I'm always interested in challenging the primacy of text and language um, as the most important thing. Either way, um, he says, in, in re reference to the Borbang up in Kwambo, and he refers that all three languages, Wongaboy and Walwan and Wiradjuri, were all mutually intelligible. He seems to group people according to the nature of their shared ceremonial practices. At the very least, I think it's clear that the reductionist European kind of nation system that we infer from the maps we currently use is insufficient. Aboriginal peoples have always been connected by a sophisticated interlinking and varied web of languages, ceremonial practices, spiritual beliefs and trade networks that defy simple definitions and mapping. The ceremonial ground itself was actually a series of interconnected spaces used for different purposes. Sorry, I, there we go. Oh, I do have a ledge, sorry, I didn't know that. Um, so the ceremonial ground was actually, it was, it was enormous actually. And it was a series of different spaces um, in the forest, usually right beside a, a creek so that there would be um, water. The central area um, was the actual Bourbon ground. It was a rough circle, about 20 to 25 metres in diameter. In the Macquarie Marshes ceremony, the circle was demarcated by digging a groove in the earth and clearing the area in the centre of loose soil and leaf litter. In the Knobel and Murrumbidgee River ceremonies, the rubble was used to form a kind of a low wall. But in all the versions, there was a single entry and exit point, and you weren't allowed to go, you, like every time you came in and out of the ground, you had to go through um, the entry point. Uh, 
second smaller ceremonial circle was formed some distance off. And this was called the Gumbo and was reserved for the men's business. Connecting the two was a winding path that was either called Jarambil or Muru. Um, and along this path, there were um, various sacred decorations carved into the earth and trees, which were called Yamun Yamun. Um, and then there was a third space called Nungulubul, which was where the old men, um, like the wise men would sit and have counsel. And every day they would have like a meeting about basically what was going to happen the next day and who was going to do what and what point of the ceremony we were up to. The hosting clans would spend months preparing the ground. In the Bulgaraga Creek ceremony, Matthews counted over 150 different designs and objects. As I read, the sheer volume and sophistication of the space took my breath away. I think, I think sometimes we have a, a simplistic version. I think we have a simplistic idea of what Aboriginal culture was before the colonies arrived. I don't know if anyone's read Dark Emu but it kind of blows open a lot of these myths about us being really uncivilized and not having access to, um, yeah, not being civilized. I've been reading the, about the, um, the Bourbon ground and it reminds me more of Notre Dame or Angkor Wat or the ancient ziggurats in terms of the complexity and sophistication of the design, um, I can't really tell you what it is because a lot of it is secret, but it's incredible. Um, and I think we, when we talk about Bora rings, we tend to think of an empty, dusty circle, but it wasn't. I think these spaces were more like temples. Yeah, I think temple is the right word. Um, one central image that recurs in all of the sites is that of Bayami. Bayami is our creator being and great father. In fact, early missionaries used him as a kind of translation for God. Belief in Bayami is shared amongst many mobs in the southeast, including Wiradjuri, Gamilaroi, Eora, Dakanjung, and Warren Wanarua. At the Bourbang sites that I've been looking at, he's represented as a massive figure built by, bounding up, by, by mounding up earth. And then next to him is an enormous handprint and the handprint is like a few meters wide and long. A recurring story attached to these images is that one day Bayami was waiting silently in a tree hunting emu. When he saw the emu, he raced out and threw his spear. And as he threw his spear, he tripped and the handprint was where he caught his fall. As a theater maker, I thought that was like a really brilliant strategy actually. If you wanted to like give people the sense of the scale and power of this gigantic being, you don't have to make the whole thing. All you have to do is just put a huge handprint that you can then step into. Um, actually, this is a common theme. I'll come back to it. But as I've gone through and, and looked at this ceremony, I, keep on, I have kept on being impressed at the level of sophistication of the dramaturgy, the theater making, the performance making um, that was demonstrated um, consistently. Another recurring image is that of the serpent. Um, one of these out of the Kenobal site was 40 meters long. In the north and east, this serpent is called the Wawi, and in the west, he's called the Korea. Other Yamun Yamun, or decorations, include images of kangaroos, emu eggs, dingoes, wombats, burrows, nests of various birds like bowerbirds, the Mali hen. There is always um, a nest of the Malian, the wedge-tailed eagle various weapons, um, spears, boomerangs, axes, and woomeras, canoes, and paddles. Um, and they're everywhere. They're just everywhere. And a big part of the ceremony is actually taking um, the boys who are being initiated through and explaining what each of those stories or symbols means. And then there were also um, abstract designs carved into the earth and stripped into the bark of the trees. Matthews details some of the stories um, behind these images, but I'm hesitant to tell them here since I'm not sure what's secret and sacred and what's for general consumption. But it strikes me how clever it was that the physical space itself was coded in such detail with so many different stories representing all different time frames. So in the one space, you could have stories that were being told of the mythical dream time 
and all the way up to something that happened last week and everything in between. Um, the Goombo, or the men's site, um, were, which was the smaller ceremonial ground, was shielded by a fence made from tree limbs and bushes and was called the Garil, or Girang. Inside the Goombo, there were these raised platforms, four, it, that made a kind of a square, and they were about a metre high and made out of logs and earth. And sometimes they would make chairs by inverting a stump on top of the um, platforms. Um, and then the, there was a certain ritual where they would stain the, um, the platforms with blood from their own gums. And it appears um, that these were used as kind of like, almost like, um, not altars, but like, yeah, like an altar where the old men, the wise men, the medicine men would stand up and direct what was happening in the ceremony. Also occurring at each site was an effigy of Durumulan. Durumulan is Bayami's brother-in-law, and he's recognisable right across the southeast of Australia since he always has a club foot or is drawn as only having one leg. Um, how he's made differs from ceremonial site to ceremonial site. Sometimes he was made out of clay and sticks and propped up against a tree, and sometimes he was actually made out of saplings already growing in the ground. Durumulan is an important figure in the Burbang. At the Bulgaraga Creek ceremony, an old man whom Matthews refers to as a Wurungimba or a medicine man, um, tells a story. The story has two parts. There's the public part that men, women and children knew. And then there was the secret part that only the men knew. Matthews published the whole story. Um, I'm not sure if he was supposed to do that. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to err on the side of caution and share with you only the public part of the story. Um, in it, it's Dora Mulan's job to take the boys away for the initiation process. He burns them down to ashes and then remakes them as new men out of the ashes and returns them to the camp with an incisor tooth missing as a sign that the boy had been initiated. The significance of that, of that story will come back in a moment. So the actual, so we've spoken about the, the ceremonial ground itself and now the, um, the actual ceremony. So the first thing that happened is the mustering process. So this was where um, a local uh, mob would decide we're going to host an initiation ceremony here. We've got a good place. There's lots of food around. There's fresh water. And then what they would do is they would send messengers out to the other mob in different camps they would send message sticks, jural, um, that would have certain symbols um, marked on them that were basically to the effect that we've got a really good place to have this um, ceremony, why don't you come? And then there was this really complex um, toing and froing between, let's call them the initiating um, uh, group and the other group. There would be this kind of sending of messengers backwards and forwards and each time one arrived, there would be like a little mini corroboree, a party like each time they would come and there would be this process of negotiating and that was happening with multiple other groups. So the actual process of mustering would take about three months. Um, and then each time a new group would arrive at the campsite, they would have um, a, a specific ceremony. Um, I don't think it would be particularly interesting for me to like detail it like he does. But what's extraordinary is the amount of detail that he writes. He writes exactly the routes that the people would take, exactly how the initiated boys, the boys to be initiated and their mothers stood, exactly the formations that they make, exactly how the, desi the designs that are painted on their body, what colors, what the different colors mean, the animals that they're representing, the exact calls they make. They, he has written the ceremony in such um, incredible detail that if we wanted to, we could reconstruct it which would be amazing. <laughs> um, I, we could basically do what we've, what we've been doing with language, which is bringing back language from the dead. We could literally do the same thing um, with his description. That's how detailed his descriptions are. Um, so yeah, so then there would be a particular ceremony for each time a new um, uh, mob arrived into the camp. And then before the, like, the proper full ceremony happened, they would have basically a corroboree every night. So they would go hunting during the day and then they would have a corroboree at night. Um, and 
um, the each mob would take turns in hosting it. Um, and I think that's a really interesting because I, I, this is a guess, right? But I think what the, so they, and they would spend like a month, like 30 days rotating the role of like the host, um, of the host clan. And I think what that might've been trying to do was to break down the power that comes from you being like the host guest power. So if you, sorry, not being very articulate with this, but like if this was your home country and someone comes to you, you're in a position of authority because you know it, it's your place, you're, it's, it's, like the diff, it's like playing on your own home ground, right? So then they would have this long process of, of sharing the hosting duties to break down that um, power hierarchy. Um, and then on uh, the final night, the final corroboree before they're going to have the, um, the, the proper central ceremony, um, he writes this very intriguing line. Um, he writes, um, on the evening preceding the main ceremony, a corroboree is held and then afterwards there is considerable sexual license allowed between men and women, whether married or single. And then he goes on to explain that the only rule is that you're only allowed to have sex with someone who you would be allowed to marry. Does that make sense? Because there are very strict rules about who you can marry or not. Um, this is intriguing. First of all, it was hilarious because the way he writes it, you can just tell he's like, um, you know, 19, 19th century gentleman's like <laughs> discomfort at having to talk about something. Um, and in fact, I, I want to make a work called Considerable Sexual License. I think that would be amazing. <laughs> but that, that's something I'd like to explore, explore a little bit more. It was one of those moments where I went, oh, that's interesting. That's something I hadn't heard of before that um, actually there might have been a liberality to sex uh, that got lost when the colonizer came. Um, anyway, so then, then we get to the, the real ceremony. Um, so there's this ceremony where the boys are taken away from the, um, from the families. Um, and this is where the story of Dora Mulan comes in. Um, so everyone comes into the Borban ground uh, everyone is painted in patterns of white ochre, except for the boys themselves who are painted completely in red ochre. Um, and their mothers are marked with, um, red, with lines and dots in red. Um, so that's something I want to explore a little bit more is this, like, what's the significance of those different colors? Cause he's very specific about what the colors, like who gets which color. Um, and then they spend kind of, uh, a whole day preparing. He goes into detail about the regalia, the way the armbands are made, the way the feathers are put into the hair, the way the kind of girdles are made with these tails made from possum skin hanging down. Um, which again, if we wanted to reconstruct the ceremony, we could do. Um, and then there's this ceremony where everyone comes into the, into the Borban ground all the women and uninitiated boys lie on the ground and then they're covered with rugs, branches, and by this point, blankets from the missions. And then this extraordinary thing happens where all of the initiated men um, reenact that ancient story of Dura Mulan kidnapping the boys to be, um, to be burnt and remade. And so they run through with burning fire sticks and they stamp on the ground around the women and they pick up the women's coolamons and dilly bags and throw them around and they'll even pick up little kids and put them up in the um in the tree um there's all these oh and they and they um use the bull roarer the mujigang which is i don't know if you've ever seen it but it's a kind of a a piece of wood on a cord that when you swing makes this kind of sounds like a bull um and that's duromulan's voice um and what got me excited about it as a performance maker is that this is like brilliant theater, actually. <laughs> um, it makes me giggle every time like I hear white fellows talk about, oh, we found this amazing new thing. It's called immersive theater <laughs> or site specific performance or durational performance. Like, nah, we've been doing that for like tens of thousands of years. Um, so, 
and and then what happens is is they they take the boys away. The boys are still covered. They take the boys away, and then the initiated men take the covers off the women. And in one of his um, descriptions, he said you could see the awe in the women's faces because they had just experienced a kind of a sensorial experience of the kid of the story. And then when the um, when the blankets are removed, the boys are gone. Um, and yeah. That's it. I'm just. I'm, that's something I want to explore. That kind of how you could use um, not just sight, but how you can use texture and sound and an immersive. You could. You probably could have felt like the brushing of the bodies. They even would like had some young men going around and um, erasing all of the footprints. So when the when the women came up, there was this mess everywhere, but no footprints, as if spirits had been there. Um, yeah, that's kind of cool. So I'm gonna. And and that's something that um, I'm – no, I'll talk about that later. This is why I've got notes. Otherwise, I'll just – you'll be here till the end of the day. Um, and then – so that's the point where the men are taken out into – the boys are taken out into the bush. Um, he also describes in detail what they do there. I'm not going to obviously talk about that because that is secret men's business. Um, but just to give you a kind of a general gloss of it, it goes for about four or five days. Um, some of the stuff really surprised me. It, there was stuff that was almost acrobatic. Um, um, there were descriptions of dancers that I hadn't seen from traditional Aboriginal dancing, say, from the north and the west of the country. And as someone who's from down here, that, that's really exciting. And I think it's something that I would love to explore more is um, to see if we can get some of those um, dancers back. Um, there was a ceremony to remove the incisor tooth. He writes that by this point, um, that had, I think the colonial authorities weren't letting them do that anymore. Um, but there was a whole ceremony about rem removing the, t the tooth. There's a whole series of dances about um, important animals and, um, and ancient stories about Bayami and Durumulan. Um, so they're out in the bush for three or four days. They keep move sorry, for four or five days, and they keep moving around as they do that. And then there's a ceremony where they return back to the Borban ground with the women. They come about halfway back and then... Um, the men wash themselves, not the boys who are being initiated, but the men wash themselves. And then the boys, who up until this point have been completely covered in red, then have white ochre dots covering covering them. And then they return back to the um, Burbang and they're re-presented back to their mothers and their sisters. Um, I was really fortunate last year to witness a version of this ceremony happening up on Yaru country, up in um, Broome. And first of all, it was extraordinary how similar it was. The blankets covering and the way the smoke was being used, everything was really similar to how I'd read about it down here. Um, and the other thing was just, it was really beautiful because it's, the ceremony is not just for the boys being initiated, the ceremony is also for the families to help them adjust to the change of their babies growing up, basically. Um, and so there's this whole ceremony. There's a few different versions of it. Um, the one up in the north is that um, the boys get onto their guardian's um, shoulders and come forward, and the women chew, um, the mothers and the sisters chew white ochre in their mouth and then spray the ochre onto the... Um, onto the faces of the boys. Um, the version down south was that the, um, the women have held this entire time, have been holding in their hands for, for days, um, uh, a tail made from possum skin that had been hanging from the boys' belts. And they've been holding onto this. And then they, there's a ceremony where they tie it to the top of a spear and then they go to the boys sitting on top of the guardian's shoulders and give them this. Sorry, I'm not explaining that very well. I can see it in my head. It's amazing. <laughs> um, basically, the point of it is this is, a, this is the moment where the boys get to come back for a moment, reconnect with the women in their family, and then they get taken again. And that's the last time um, 
from that point on, they don't camp with their mothers anymore. They don't live with their mothers. In fact, there's a restricted period of time where they're not even allowed to talk with the women in their family. Um, then it's all over, basically. Um, he writes that um, everyone's keen to go back to their country because they've probably been there for like six weeks. Um, uh, yeah, so that's been, that's been the main focus of what I've been reading about. Um, I've got so much material there. I can probably make, probably make about like six works um, out of it. Uh, and so there's a couple of things that are going to happen from this point, I think. There's a fork in the road. Um, one is I'm going to make this work. Um, um, it's going to be a work of contemporary dance, basically, um, an immersive work in an, on a large scale where I want to draw on all these kind of elements, the designs that were painted on the body, the designs that are carved into the ground and on the trees, the particular descriptions of the movements, the formations of the dancers, the interactions between um, audiences and performers that are described. Um, so that's one I'm going to take, it's probably take me quite a long time because um, it's going to be a really big work, but I'm really inspired um, and I have lots of ideas for that. So watch this space. Um, and the other thing is I would love to be a part of a project of bringing this ceremony back to life. Um, I don't think I'm the right person for that. I have done some traditional um, dancing. I'm not a very good traditional dancer. Um, but I, um, uh, there are people who are bringing ceremony back. And so I would love to share everything I've found um, with those people. And so I've started a process of like reaching out and talking with some people. Uh, yeah, that, that would be amazing. Imagine if this ceremony that hasn't been done uh, for over 100 years, imagine if it came back. That'd be cool. Um, there, was some, there was kind of a little bit of other... While I was going through all of this stuff, I was also grabbing anything that was of interest to me. Um, I haven't really processed any of it, but um, I found some dreaming stories that I'd never heard before. Um, and might very possibly have not been heard or heard of for a long time. In particular, there was a great one um, that explains why the owl has wider eyes. Um, I also found some interesting notes on Bayami. Um, uh, I also looked at the Charles Kerry photographs. Um, Charles Kerry was a um, was a photographer, um, and Matthews got Kerry in to the take some photos um, of this ceremony, um, which are, they're, they're really beautiful. They're really incredible. Again, secrets of men's business. Sorry, I can't show them. Um, lots of information on the totemic structure um, and the marriage laws. Um, I, he even wrote some music. He could score music. So I'm super excited to give to my composer um, some traditional Wiradjuri melodies. Um, in particular, there's a war chant that is amazing that was sung as the um, war party was going, um, yeah, on the war path. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Um, I do want to take a moment just to thank the staff here at the library. Um, I'm not a scholar, uh, um, so I had to be showed like really showed the ropes um, and constantly forgot what I was, um, how to do anything. And people were so patient um, and genuinely curious with me and genuinely excited um, about the research I've been doing and absolutely committed to trying to do things culturally correctly. Um, and yeah, I just want to um, thank the staff um, at the library here because you've been amazing. So thank you very much. journey, hey? Um, 
dancer, choreographer, and all those other things I said before, what I was remiss in doing myself, so adding poet and storyteller to that, <laughs> as I think we just, we can all agree, um, but after hearing that. Um, I have to say from a personal level, um, my, my grandfather was a well one man, and his mother was from Kwambaran, and his grandfather was a man called Billy Brandy, who was from Quambo. And as I was sitting there listening to you, Joel, I've, it occurred to me that it's completely within the realms of possibility, if not likelihood, that your great grandfather and my great grandfather participated in a ceremony like that together. I know, right? Yeah. 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 Um, and as a woman, I know that this Matthews material is here, but it's not for me to read. So I feel like I've been given a. I'm like that woman peeking out from the blanket going, wow. <laughs> yeah. So on that note, I'm going to open it up to some questions. If you've got a question, can you just pop your hand up and wait for either Sharon or Kat to come to you with the um, microphone? That's just because um, we're recording this speech. Uh, we need to have the microphone there. Yeah. Thank you, that was amazing. What I want to know is, why does the owl have white eyes? <laughs> so, like the super abbreviated version of the story um, is that his best mate was the cyclone um, and he, they would go out hunting together and they hung out and the, but the owl kept on opening his eyes wider and wider and wider trying to see the cyclone who he couldn't see. So, the, it's, the story is amazing, it describes like um, when they went hunting, he would just see the spear and the woomera floating in the air. Um, and then basically one night his curiosity, it's the curiosity killed the cat kind of a story, and his curiosity overcame him. And he, while the cyclone was sleeping, he opened up the, the rug and looked in. Um, and then the cyclone like destroyed everything and he got stuck with his eyes open. Um, hi, Joel. Hello. Uh, I'm Chris Sainsbury. I worked with your dad quite closely at Eora College. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you're a performance maker and, and uh, an artist. Um, and uh, Chris is uh, an educator and an activist. Um, and I wonder if you could speak in what ways um, do Aboriginal artists and music musicians and performance makers have a different role as to, to to play in Australia as to Aboriginal politicians and activists. Um, and thinking about that from your own family from one generation to the next, even though he's also a musician. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, my uh, father um, was a leader of the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Rights Movement. Um, in fact, he wrote the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Rights Act and was the first registrar of Aboriginal lands. Um, and um, I actually found out a lot of the story in the last couple of weeks as we were driving around. Um, I think uh, I think you're right. I think artists, I think Aboriginal artists um, play a bigger role than just being artists. Uh, and in fact, like a lot of the, the political movements that happened started from, you know, like I think of like the Black Theatre in Redfern, um, started off as a theatre, but it was also the hotbed of a lot of the activism that was happening in the 70s. Um, so, and I think when I speak with other, with my peer Indigenous artists, I, th I feel like we have a mantle on us that's bigger than just entertaining people. Um, I think we are what we do is inherently political and it's about pushing the dial and to making change happen in a country that still has quite a long way to go in terms of grappling with the black history that we have here um, and and also grappling with the um, the consequences of colonization you know ill health and um, under education underrepresentation poverty all those things that we know um, yeah, I think my, I know my work definitely like grapples with a lot of that stuff. Um, and so I do feel like I'm continuing my dad's legacy in many ways. Um, he was really critical in 
the process of reclaiming our language and a lot of what I'm doing in reclaiming our ceremonial practice, I'm very conscious that I'm continuing in his footsteps with that. I was just wondering, do you know the age of the boys when they were taken? Uh, yeah, so it was it, it was somewhere between nine and fifteen, which is a pretty big um, gap. A thing I didn't mention is actually you had to do three ceremonies, um, and they would happen every few years. So it was a, it was a whole, the whole process could take you like yeah eight to nine years, and even then you just got initiated into the first level. Um, there was like a there was a whole knowledge hierarchy that went all the way up to the medicine man. The, like the wise men. Thank you, Joel. My question is about how do you notate your work when you're creating it? Do you use, and I know very little about choreography, but do you use the same notational symbols as they would for, say, Rada or one of the more classical ballet groups? Or have you created your own notation to give instructions and to remember what it is that you're doing when you come back to it? Um, I, I don't notate. Um, uh, I think notation is only really necessary once you become big enough that you won't necessarily be able to be in the studio you know, if I was like, um, one day maybe, a world famous choreographer and some company in Finland wants to put my work on, then I need to have it notated. But um, notation is a very crude tool. Um, and so most dancers, we keep it in our bodies or we use video, we use a video a lot. Yeah. yeah. So when I like, if I haven't done a work of mine for like a year or two, so I'll, the first thing I'll do is I'll pull back the video and I go, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, hi, Joel. Um, my name is Brenda Croft, uh, Gurindji Mullion Mutbara woman. I work at the ANU. And I just wanted to say, it's not a question, but just how inspirational your talk has been. I, could, I had so much going on in my head listening to you. And I hope that we can get you to come and do something with us at the ANU because um, I'm working with Chris on a, a big project there that we hope to get people in. So. Just wonderful to see what young people are doing. Your, your name had actually been su suggested by a uh, um, dear friend, Marinda Donnelly. So when I saw that you were speaking here, I was really excited about coming and hearing you. And I actually um, did work with your dad back in the 80s in um, Sydney. He helped advise us at Bumali and through the Aboriginal National Theatre Trust. So it's just really fantastic to see what you're doing and hear the enthusiasm and excitement um, in your work because we're so blessed with being able to have access to archives and it's people like yourself who um, open those doors for other people who don't even realise that that material is there. There's such a wealth of material. So more power to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.